so many people here in this country did not realize what happened at the very beginning of World War II. As you know, they had Pearl Harbor on December the 7th, 1941. The day after Pearl Harbor, we declared war, not only on Japan, but on Germany. At that time, we were in a heck of a shape. We had been exporting like crazy over to England our Lend-Lease material. We had been exporting to a lot of the countries through the Baltic region. Also to France, our aircraft we were sending abroad. We never thought about our home defense. We never thought about anything in that nature. Lo and behold, we find ourselves in a world war, a big world war, completely 360 degrees of around the earth. What in the world are we going to do? Washington was framed. People tried to reason with some of the senators and congressmen, let's do this, let's do that. There were a few level heads that put the whole picture together and started. But I want to first start my story out. I graduated from Westerville High School in 1940. I entered Otterbein College. I went through my freshman year and Lo and behold, you the second week in Otterbein, my freshman year, the government came out with a program called CPT, Civilian Pilot Training Program. Well, that gives you extra college credits, 16, I believe, if you take all three courses. Now, there's a little hitch. You could take the primary. No obligations to the military. But if you took the secondary and cross country, you're obligated to sign up with either the Navy, or the Air Force, Air Corps, they called it then, or the Marine Corps. So I wanted to be a Navy pilot. I wanted to fly F 4Fs off the carrier, the Old Hornet, the Saratoga, the Lexington, some of those. That appealed to me. The F 4F, Wildcat, they called it in the Navy. So I signed up for that program. I took my night school down at Capitol University and did my flying with Lane Aviation in Columbus, out of Fort Columbus. Then I took my secondary through Ohio State University on the completion of my 40 hours of training with the primary program. I took that at Ohio State, my secondary program, and I learned to fly acrobatics and all types of primary work that you do in the military. Then they came the cross-country course. That was another 40 hours. It was a total of 40 hours in each one of the segments. I took my cross-country in a stints and reliance through Foster Lane and through Ohio State University. On the completion of that, I was a pretty hot shot pilot. Well, I wanted more time. So I would go out and proposition Lee Miller, which was in hangar number two at Port Columbus for odd jobs on the weekend. Maybe servicing planes, pushing them out of the hangar. Then I'd go down to Foster Lane. I had a license. I could take and hop around any errands they had. I could fly any of their plane. I worked for Foster Lane. And Mrs. Denton over at Norton Field which no longer exists, it's a housing project now. It was just south of Port Columbus, and when the war came along, they had to close it up. But anyway, I would fly over there. So I got to flying in the Fairchild 24, the Stinson Reliant, and many other makes of planes, private planes. And I thought, well, that's pretty good. Well, I was finishing up my second year of college, Ottawa. On June the 15th, I was to report to Pensacola to start my training in an OCS program and then going to my cadet program for the Navy. Well, hello and behold, yeah, I had a date with my <laughs> wife then, uh, my girlfriend, which later became my wife for 63 years mm -hmm. until she died. But Jackie and I had a ball and we went down to the Palace Theater in Columbus, the old palace there on Broad Street. And coming down the stairs after the show, I met Hutch Williams, his father had a big restaurant uptown called Williams Grill, and he had his date, and his date had a friend that was visiting her, so he, Harry, he got uh, Harry Bean to go along with him, and when we met there on the staircase at the Palace Theater, Hutch said, let's take Dad's new car, I got Dad's brand new Buick, let's go up to Old Tangy Village and get a sandwich, and that sounded like a pretty good idea. Well, my car was parked down on Front Street in the parking garage. We went up, coming back, it was raining. Lo and behold, you had slipped on the car tracks. That's when you used to have streetcar tracks down Broad Street, 
uh, I mean, down High Street and down Front Street, and there was two lanes of car tracks there, and he skidded on the car tracks, and a great big downtown hydrant that sits right there at the corner of Broad Street and Front Street, in front of the Lebec Lincoln Tower Building, we called the EIU then. We tried to take that off, but it didn't move. <laughs> the car just kind of wrapped right around it. Well, that banged up uh, Hutch's girlfriend pretty bad. And the police come over right away with a black Mariah and took us out to the old St. Anthony's Hospital beside Grant. And we took us in there for, which we call EMS now. And we were all examined and everything. And it was about 1.30 in the morning before I could send Harry down on the streetcar to pick my car up on Front Street and coming back so we'd have transportation home. And we agreed, uh, oh, Hutch's girlfriend, uh, her father and mother came down to the hospital. Took the two girls home, and then that left Harry and Hutch and Jackie and myself to come back to Westerville in my car. We agreed that the next morning we'd meet at Williams Grill and tell Mr. and Mrs. Williams what happened to their car and all about the accident. <laughs> so we sat down, we were going to have breakfast back in the back end of the restaurant. And Mrs. Williams comes over to me and said, Bob, you don't look good. <laughs> I said, well, after running my head through the days of your car, I don't feel too good. <laughs> it was all bandaged up and everything. Well, I want you to go over and see Doc Scatterday. He was a DO that was there on College Avenue. So I went over to see Doc to please her. And he said, you're in luck. I'm going down to the hospital. I'm going to take a, have an x-ray taken of that neck and upper regions of your body. I said, OK. We went down to the hospital. Oh, behold, they found I had a fracture of the sixth and seventh cervical of the neck. I thought, holy cow. So they are going to put the, one of these harnesses on me and brace. For, and I had to wear that for three months. Well, I finally put that on. And I had to contact the Navy and advise them that I wouldn't meet the, the schedule for the program. I might as well go back and re-register back in Otterbein for myself, for my junior year at Otterbein. So I got re-registered and everything. And I was kind of moping around for about a month and a half because I didn't dare fly or anything with that fracture. So, <clears throat> lo and behold, yeah, one Saturday morning, boom, I heard the paper hit the porch and I was living with a neighbor. My mother had died in 1940. My dad was out at Elwood, Illinois. He was a, an engineer with the uh, Army, so I didn't get to see dad too often. So I was living with a neighbor. And I brought the paper in and right there on the headlines of the old Columbus Dispatch, Pilots needed desperately. The man of base at Panama City, Florida, fly private aircraft. Hmm, I thought, well, didn't make the Navy program. I wonder if I could get into the, this thing. Nobody's taken away my license. Let's see if I can't get in. So I went upstairs quietly, and I very carefully took the brace off, went back downstairs, and this man said, where are you going, Bob? Where's that brace? I said, I took it off to see how my neck would work. Oh, you've got to wear that another month and a half. I said, well, I'm going to just try it for a little while, Mrs. Bean. Well, I mean, took my papers that I had with me from CPT training and also my certified log book, and I went down to Commander Stone of the CAP in Columbus and Senator Forey's office. Well, boy, as soon as I walked in, I showed my papers. I didn't say anything about my neck. I showed him the papers. I was accepted in CAP. Well, you're going to have to get a uniform. And I said, well, okay, what do I have to do? Well, you go up North High Street and you purchase your uniform. Have you got enough money to buy the uniform? I said, well, I can buy a summer way uniform. And they said, well, you're in luck because there's a man by the name of Binger coming in from Oklahoma City. He's going to be an observer down there and he's going to drive through. And you can ride down to Panama City, Florida with him. He had one of these old Hudsons. So uh, we drove to Florida. Well, I was never so disillusioned in my life. I looked out across that field when we got there, and it looked like nothing but scrub palms, sand, sand fleas, and what you think of it, that part of the train around there. You look out over that pile of debris, and there's St. Andrew's Bay. Not a building on the place. Well, back in the 20s, Florida had a big land boom, and they were going, uh, real estate people were going to build these cities, and people were going to just pour down there and buy the lots and move in like they did in the 50s. Well, back in the 20s, Lynn Haven, Florida, which is about six miles out of Panama City, 
was going to do the same thing. This airport had been scraped out with bulldozers. The longest runway we had was 2,700 feet, 1,700 for the north and south runway. Now, that's not much room to land a plane in. But anyway, that was scraped out, but it was rough. And here was these guys that had gone, flown some planes down, and there was eight airplanes on the field. They were civilian planes, Fairchild, there was a Stinson Reliant, there was a couple of Cessnas there. Now, the holy cow, what have I gotten into? Well, I was met by Bob Dodge, who was commander from Murraysville, Ohio. He was in the bridge building business. And uh, he said, I understand uh, your papers are all in order. And I said, yes, they are. Well, he said, I had a call from Columbus, and he said, uh, you would be coming in. I want Cheney Vance to take you up and check you out immediately in the aircraft that we have available. I said, okay, but I signed on as a pilot observer. He said, well, we're going to see what your capabilities are. Maybe you can make straight pilot. You don't have to do any observing, and it's higher pay. Well, that appealed to me. Well, the second lieutenant paid $2,100 a year. First lieutenant paid $2,700 a year. That made a big difference. That's a lot of money, $2,700 I bought back then. So I went ahead and took my check right in all the points. The next two days, Janie and I flew all over St. Andrews Bay and everything. Lo and behold, it, he said, you know, you, you, you've been schooled by somebody. I said, yes, I've had CPT training. He said, I can tell it. He said, you're far better than some of those 50 and 60 year old parts that I had around in Europe. <laughs> and so uh, those were businessmen that were druggists, lawyers, doctors, and so forth that had a private plane. And they would only fly them on Sunday when they were free. Well, he wanted pilots like myself that was young, full of them, bigger and vitality. I never told him anything about the neck. So anyway, he said, uh, I hear you signed up for the program. I said, yeah. He said, well, we're going to be dropping bombs and death charges if we can find any subs. And we're given to September the 15th to be prepared. So he said, uh, believe it or not, there's not a building on the block property. But we found a 3C camp the other side of Lynn Haven, about eight miles. We're having that old 3C camp. Back during the Depression, they used to have the 3C workers, and they'd work out on the roads and on in the woods and so forth. Well, this abandoned C, uh, CCC camp was going to be moved over, and that was going to become our base. Well, that sounded pretty good. In the meantime, the Air Force put up a tent city in Panama City that we were to live in, and that was our quarters for a month month and a half. So I went back and forth in the old 6 to 6 truck that we had, a military truck. Then one day, here comes a lieutenant from the regular army and from Dale Major Field, Tallahassee. And he had six enlisted men with him, from sergeants right on down to Prague. They were our armament crew. And lo and behold, the truck following was full of 100-pound demolition bombs and ash cans. Ash cans are depth charges. They also had some World War I, not World War II, but World War I bomb racks. And he said, we're going to try to mount them on your planes. But lo and behold, the Cessna was the only one that could take three 100-pound demo bombs. The Fairchild was too weak to support, the fuselage wouldn't support the bombs. And the Stinson Reliant could carry the ash can. That's the only plane we had that could carry the ash can far enough off the runway that you wouldn't pull the thing off when you took off. So it was kind of a haphazard thing. Well, Bob Dodd said, there was 12 of us that were selected to be first pilots. He said, I want you to take some of the other observers with you. Get yourself familiar with the coastline. So each morning we would take off. This is before we did patrol duty. You've got to get familiar with all the coast, every inlet, everything. So you know it by heart, because it's going to be foggy here before long. And he said, when it gets foggy, you want to be able to recognize exactly where you are when you come into shore. That sounds fine. Well, keep in mind, private aircraft could never fly over water unless they were within gliding distance of the shore. That was the law. Well, World War II dropped that law. We sometimes were 80 miles out. You can't glide one of those planes 80 miles. Uh, we were working against adversities. We did have one thing in our favor. 